Hi, I'm Dr. Cindy Dupuy. I have a PhD in learning disabilities. I do diagnostic assessment, a little bit of intervention and advocacy. I'm also an adult with dyslexia and dysgraphia. Kim Charman, I'm a reading and writing remediation specialist. I work with kids from kindergarten through college. On dyslexia, dysgraphia, executive functioning, you work with kids with yes. ADHD, oh. you work with kids with very complex profiles. You are my frequent go-to. <laughs> She's amazing with my students. All right, so we have talked a little bit about verbal comprehension. So now we want to talk about fluid reasoning. Hmm. So Kim, when you see fluid reasoning, you as a parent, what do you think? I think of someone um, who maybe has very logical uh, thinking process, cause and effect. Maybe they can go abstract a little bit and think of deeper Am I wrong? No, you're exactly right. But I'm going to tell you, most parents are like, what the heck is fluid reasoning? Well, I just think of it logically. You know, it's like, you know. Well, that's because you you've read a lot of diagnostic reports. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can have someone with amazing fluid reasoning, but they have a lot of defect deficiencies elsewhere. Right. So let's come to a more formal definition. Fluid reasoning is your ability to recognize patterns, um, to take in information, understand relationships, and then reach a conclusion based on that. It's really kind of a pure measure of thinking skills per se, mm. without necessarily having to have deep language. I don't want to apply that there's not language involved in it because I have a lot of kids that will process through it verbally, mm. but it is, um, it's kind of like your ability to problem solve. Yes. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Very cognitive, yes. Okay, so there's two subtests that go into the fluid reasoning score. Um, one is called matrix reasoning, and the other is called figure weights. Which do you want to talk about first? Matrix reasoning. Okay, so matrix reasoning, and we've done a video where we talk about each of the individual subtests. So if you want to see little examples of what this looks like, you can kind of do a deeper dive there. But Matrix reasoning either looks at, can you recognize a sequential pattern? So for example, you might have one star, then two stars, then three stars, then four stars, and then a question mark, and you would obviously put in five stars, okay? The other way it can work is it can have a matrix, which can either be a two by two square, or it can be a three by three square. And the principle behind a matrix is you have a pattern going across horizontally, and you have a pattern going down vertically. And the pattern will work both horizontally and vertically across the entire matrix. Is this like a Sudoku kind of concept or not? Uh, it kind of is, but it's um, it's literally, it's recognizing those levels of patterns. Now, the other thing that's really interesting is, is the problems get more complex. You have layers of patterns. So initially, like we gave the example of one star, two stars, three stars, right? Super simple. Um, you might start off with one circle, two triangles, three square. Like you can add nuance to it. And again, that's oversimplification, but you get the idea. And one thing that I miss in the whisk that they have in the waist, and we're going to do a whole thing on comparing the whisk and the waist. But in the waist, they do this whole explanation of the pattern works both going across and going down. You should only look across a dione. You should not look on the diagonal. And many kids will make that mistake where they'll go, oh, it goes from there to there. So the third one has to be a repetition of that. And that's not what matrix reasoning is about. And um, they give a little bit of that uh, um, explanation in the whisk, but not as much depth. But so you're seeing the patterns, you're understanding what the patterns are, and then you're applying it so that you can follow through and complete that. Now, do you know what one of the major, what major factor can dramatically affect your performance on the WISC? ADHD. Yes, why? Oh my God, it just, because you lose your train of thought as you're trying to establish a pattern. If something disrupts your mind, then you lose your pattern that you are trying to conceive of. Um, it's it's a constant, it's like someone throwing balls at your head constantly. That's what people don't understand. It is so disruptive to the thinking and learning process. 
And I think you've shared before, you yourself live with ADHD. Yeah, and I didn't know it until, <laughs> until I told you. <laughs> until I had a second child. That's when it hit me. But I, I got through college very well and a very good college. But You see Berkeley? But but she explained the reason why I got through it is because I compensated by creating really good executive functioning skills. Yeah. So the other place is not just, you know, ping pongs being thrown against your ping pong balls being thrown against your head as you're looking at patterns, but they intentionally put in answers that are visually very similar. Mm. And I have kids impulsively select the first one they see or select the most major characteristics and they miss nuance. So for example, they might have an answer in which there's a bar across the front versus a bar across the back and where the position of the bar is makes a huge difference. There might be a difference in color. So the number of items is correct. You're cracking me up. There was a bug, sorry. <laughs> Not that you have attention deficit at all. It's a steam bug. <laughs> Our walking case study. Um, so they will not notice subtle details and that will then affect their overall performance. Now you wouldn't think missing easy items would dramatically affect your final score, mm. but it does. If you miss a couple of items early on on really easy items, it dramatically affects your ability to get an accurate score so I have kids that will miss super simple items and go on to get the hardest, most complex items 100% correct. Like the minute it gets super challenging, they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. They hyper-focus, they dig in deep, and they get all the answers right. And sometimes it takes them a while to get into the hyper. You have to explain hyper-focusing, which is one of the few gifts of ADHD. Well, we can argue whether or not it's a gift. But anyway, explain what hyper-focus feels like to you. I think it's fun, but what hyper-focusing means is that, um, and that's why people say, I don't understand. My kid can do Legos for 18 hours, but he can't sit still during a math test or whatever. It, it hyper-focusing allows you to go deep into, um, it's kind of like the flow that you've heard of where you get into what you're doing, but you forget the rest of the world exists. But I also will it explain it to parents as you either have a really thick buffer and you're like in your own little cocoon or you have none. But when you're in the hyper-focusing mode and you're in that cocoon, man, yeah, it's, the world it's really is quiet. Yeah. And it, it is really fun. However, it's not so uh, efficient when it comes to forgetting that you have appointments or vegetables in the oven burning. Okay. Now let's not too much digress into attention deficit. What are other factors that can also affect performance on the matrix reasoning task? Um, oh, uh, dysgraphia, difficulty. Oh yeah. Visual. No, just no, there's no motor component to matrix reasoning at all. There's five answer choices and you tell me the number of the answer. Oh, so the visual, um, visual, visual perception piece, right? Does your oh, eye yeah. pick up the detail? Do you register the detail? Are you attending to the detail and the importance of the detail? Okay. Yes. And so kids won't perceive those subtle, but important details and that can cause their score to go low. They can also not have good internal dialogue for problem solving. Yes. Right. If I can't, if I can't, if I get stuck because I don't recognize what's going on, I throw my hands up in the air and I don't try anything else because I don't know anything else to try. Does that make and, sense? Yeah. And yeah, because I've done it. And by the way, um, all these things can be taught and practiced. You know, the ADHD makes it more difficult, but with these other skill sets, you can um, deal with those other issues by, yes. by training and practice. Yes. We you can teach time. kids how to think deeply and critically, and we overlook that as a factor. Yeah. And a more okay. manner. So what does it mean when you're really good at matrix reasoning? What does it mean when you're really good? Um, you... I just would say attention to detail and um, no matrix reason. It can be. I happen to be amazing at it. Yeah. She can die, look at numbers and see patterns and all sorts of like split second. Yeah. Um, I see patterns. I like to try and figure out what patterns are. I like to understand the nuts and gears behind it. 
Like I'm always looking for subtlety and nuance in what's happening and why, which is, I think, part of the reason I'm a reasonably good diagnostician. I want to know what's happening. And when I see certain behaviors, I want to go deeper to understand what's happening and why. And so um, in matrix reasoning, these are kids that I talk about them being earthquake kids. Like if we were in the middle of an earthquake, I want a kid with good fluid reasoning skills because they'll figure out how to erect a structure using a car or using, you know, whatever. They'll figure out how to purify water. Like, it's that ability to problem solve in the moment and work fluidly and see solutions that other people don't see. Now, the challenge can be you can have great fluid reasonings, reasoning skills, but you don't have the ability to express what you're thinking. So other yeah. people can't follow what you're trying to do. Right. So it doesn't help that you you get it. If you can't express yourself through verbal communication or written communication, people don't get how smart you are. Or that what are you, you doing? Have. Why are you doing that? That's never going to work. And you're like, no, 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 I've got this. Trust me. Give me a minute, right? Yeah. Trust and me, so, but I can't tell you why to trust me. Yeah. These are also the kids that will frequently, you give them a math problem and they'll write down the answer and the teacher's like, you had a calculator, you did something else, you saw the problem ahead of time. There's no way you could do that in their head. And a lot of times yeah. kids can do it in their heads. My husband, who never wrote down any of his math work whatsoever, can think in base 16, which is a computer thing. Um, and he's everybody used to complain about the fact that he never showed his work. He is severely dyslexic, severely dysgraphic, and has ADHD. He's got the triple whammy on a number of levels. Um, but he can do amazing things in his head, and I'm always in awe. It cracks me up because I will hand him my laptop and he will touch it. And I'm like, why is it not fixed yet? <laughs> because he's so good at figuring out what's happening and why. And I will warn you, if you have a kid who also has dysgraphia, which difficulty connecting the brain thoughts to the fingers, these kids will be accused of, I have brilliant kids who have been accused of cheating in math because they're not writing their work down yeah. because they can figure it out in their head. Yeah. So they have good fluid reasoning. All right. So now that we beat that horse to the point of pummeling, uh, let's move to figure weights, mm. okay? So on this one, a kid is shown the super simple one. You're shown a scale and you have to balance the scale. So if there's a yellow square on one side, you put a yellow square on the other side, the scale is balanced. Um, then they move to having two scales. So they will establish a relationship in the first two scales. So they might say, a yellow square is equal to a red triangle. Mm -hmm. And on the other scale, they would have a red triangle and a question mark, and you have to figure out which of the five choices goes there. That's super simple, and they get way more abstract and way more complex. And then at the very end, you have three scales, and you're having to figure out the relative relationship values of the different shapes to the other shapes and do these conversions in your head. So multi-step conversion. Yes. Okay. Now, the big difference between matrix reasoning and figure weights, well, there's a couple big differences, but another big difference on the test is figure weights is timed. Oh. So there's a maximum time allowed to provide a response. And if you you get um you get a little bit of a signal, but not a really obvious one that you need to respond. And if you don't respond within the time limit, you get zero credit. So if you're one second over the allowed time limit, worth nothing. Wow. Okay. So if you have a problem with visual spatial and you're not seeing. Yeah. It's not so much visual spatial. It's being able to hold conversions in your head. So one red triangle equals two yellow squares and two yellow squares could be converted to, like there's lots of holding in your head doing something with it and then so working so, memory. yeah so working memory so if you have trouble with working memory and i need to write it down there's no pen and paper okay all mental because i could do it if i was writing it down but it's timed and you can't write it down so yes. that means i have a problem with vision you know I have a problem with that, yeah. Uh, you would have a problem with that because of working memory demands, because you write everything down. That's how you hold things in your memory. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, there's also nuance of, did you double check to make sure the color and the shape are right? Hmm. Okay. Um, there's also nuance of, did you double check your work? Hmm. Right? Again, if you miss really easy items and go on to get the hardest ones right, what happened? And you can't really double check your work on paper. You have to double check your work in your mind. That's yes. wowie. Um, it's a really challenging test. I really love it. It lets my kids that are absolutely amazing at math, they go bing. Right. You see it. And you're like, holy macro. Like you sit wow. in awe when these kids can throw it out. Wow. Hmm. And so um, there's lots of reasons, very similar to the matrix reasoning, why you may have difficulty with it. Um, we put two dimension demands on your working memory. You were distracted during the task. Um, you didn't, you don't have great processing speed. So you need more time to respond. You don't pay attention to little details or your eye doesn't pick up little details. And so you make errors in recognizing shapes and quantities and things like that. And I frequently have that where a kid will miscount the number of shapes that are there. Mm -hmm. And so it looks right, but there's two balls off or whatever, and they'll give the wrong answer. Okay. And then if you're really good at it, um, it's probably most analogous or most like mathematics in understanding quantity and number and how we think in that realm. Um, these are also kids that can think and react very quickly. Um, I will have kids who will instinctively get a response, like they'll respond, they'll look at it, and in three or four seconds, we'll give an answer. And they naturally have that ability to see that quantity and get the right answer. It's, and like, that, a, it's like a computer generated. It's like everything yeah. fires at the same time, whereas I can do it, but it would take me the multiple steps to think through it. So yeah, they, there are kids that naturally just see it and they know it. And that's why it looks like a miracle or yeah. something. And that's where I sit in the, you know, in yeah. bow in honor of greatness because. Wow. It's I'm not quite gift. there. It's a gift that's received. Yeah. And wow. again, these are the kids that won't write their answers down in math because they do it all in their head. And teachers are like, nobody can do that. Well, the answer is yes, they can. And so you shouldn't make an assumption mm -hmm. that they've done anything wrong or they've cheated or anything else. They can naturally have this ability to do this and just be phenomenal at it. However, I will say there comes a point with some kids that can do it to a certain level but once things get more complex, they don't want to write things down. Then they start to get in trouble yeah. because they can't go back and check their work. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's more discussion on dysgraphia and right. repercussions thereof. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Look Good. for more.